the the fact remains this is that uh, when you look at in corporate America, you either drive culture or culture organically happens and it's yes. done to you. Yes. And so for me, I'm like, look, let's sit down with leadership and the ownership and figure out what kind of culture do you want to have here? And then we start to build teams through that and we build processes through that. Um, you can hire to that type of thing too, if you're sophisticated enough with it, yeah. um, which is why I use behavioral assessments because I want to see how people are hardwired. Yeah. You know, when you're in an interview with someone, uh, that's the best version of themselves. Welcome to Corporate Caffeine. On today's episode, Kyle and I talked to Tim Berry, the CEO of Sandler Training in Fort Worth and an executive coach. Now, Tim got a job before he was legally able to, and when he was busted because of lying about his age, he decided to go into business for himself, and he never looked back. He sold the company that he started as a teenager and just kept rinsing and repeating that formula. Now, he is a master sales trainer. And there is a lot of psychology behind what he does and why he's so good at helping other people be successful. Let's jump right in because you are going to love this conversation. Tim Berry, we are so excited to have you on Corporate Caffeine. Welcome to our humble abode. Thank you. This is not just a humble abode. It's beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. We got lucky on it. And uh, nice to finally meet you. I've heard a lot about you for a long time now, yes. and I'm like, who is this Tim Berry? Who is this guy? So, <laughs> who is this nut? Yeah, yeah, I've heard a little bit of that about that too. Oh, oh yeah, a little crazy. Oh yeah, I can't take uh, you can't take yeah. life too seriously ever. Nah, <clears throat> life is too short. Uh, I think the, when you look at the world today, where we spend so much time looking for different ways to be outraged, and for me, I just look for different ways to be thankful and uh, and for areas where I find massive humor. So now you, are you always like that? Because of course, like I know you behind the scenes, right? Like CEO to CEO yep. and cracking jokes and making light of difficult things and just adding some levity to sometimes serious situations. So but do, are you that guy on the client side and on like the day-to-day operation side? Uh, you know, it's a good question. I could be very, uh, I tend to be very professional with my clients uh, until it's appropriate to be obnoxious <laughs> and sarcastic. And when they understand the context behind what I'm saying, I think I, I would never do that with someone new because, uh, again, they don't know where my heart is. So if I say something off, you know, just a little bit sarcastic or use some, some you know, wicked humor in there somewhere, I don't want anybody to be off put. Yeah. And so I'll yeah. tend to be very chill in the beginning, uh, understand what type of temperament the person I'm communicating with has what their primary and their secondary disc profiles, for example, would be. And then I'll mirror and match that appropriately. And as time goes by, not even during one conversation, but several conversations, uh, then I'll know where and when I can kind of throw a zinger in there or be a little goofy. Yeah. So yeah. That's awesome. I think when I do, you know, when I when I'm doing trainings and, and the like, uh, you've got to be able to mix in, uh, you know, stories and, and have relevant experiences that you can share because otherwise you're just vomiting content on someone, which is yeah. horrifically boring. Yeah. Does that answer the question? It totally does. And I mean, I I kind of get it. Uh, you know, I mean, Kyle knows this about me better than you know probably anybody. But I will ramp up whatever goofy, quirky, you know, charisma or something on stage. Like it's the biggest when I'm in training in stage environments or workshops. And then one-to-one, I'm probably my most serious because I'm about, excuse my language, but getting shit done. You know what I mean? Like when we're like in meeting environments or when I'm running a client meeting or something, you know, it's not like we might laugh or smile, but I'm kind of like, Hey, we got 45 minutes and I'm going to respect this, but we're going to get some stuff done here. And then, you know, and then there's just the wide range, you know, like while the other, you know, like areas of your personality that you kind of push and pull, you know, depending on appropriateness. But I've always only, only seen you like you have a lot of seriousness, but you are always funny, funny, funny. So that's why I was like, do you do that all the time? I like how you worded the intro when you're like, you know, I like to bring humor in, in a world that's, um, 
negative right now. You, you always hear people talk about, oh, the world's so chaotic right now. It's never been this bad. Well, I don't agree that it's been that it's bad. Agreed. Like history, or if you pull up data, it's not bad right now. We're the best we've ever been as far as poverty levels, all these type of things. For sure. It's the negativity that's perceived in people and that, that's transparent in social media and this, that, and the other where you're like, well, we're just hearing the negative side of this person. Right. They don't highlight the positives a lot of times. Yeah. And Kyle, to your point, Stephen yeah. Pinker wrote a book called uh, Angel, the better, Angels of Our Better Nature or something like that. It's about a gigantic book. It's about 700 pages long. And what he does is he goes back through the history of time and he literally proves out that right now is the safest time in human history that there ever was to not die by violence. Yeah. Maybe I've heard him in a podcast. That name rings a bell. I know I haven't read the book, especially when it's 700 pages. <laughs> I, maybe an audible if I've got long enough. But um, I, maybe I've listened to him in a podcast and, he, and I was, he was describing statistically why we are in a good time right now. I bet you it was him. Yeah. It was interesting. That's so cool. Very interesting. Well, I mean, I also think like it's, Okay, it doesn't do us any good. It doesn't serve us individually or collectively to say things are terrible, like the world's gone to hell in a handbasket, you know, everything is bad. Because, what, like, what kind of self fulfilling prophecy are you creating there? Right. You know, I mean, like, how does that serve anyone, including your own, you know, goals? But if you're like, wow, safest, most prosperous time in history, yeah. look at all this opportunity. And if we can trust, the whole history of humanity, that means it's going to keep going in that direction. Right. And that we are resilient and things are abundant. That's a great point of view. And that's something that should instill confidence in ourselves and culture in general that yeah. we're moving forward. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. So. Even in the 20th century, if you look at, uh, there were about 130 million murders due to World War II, like 20 million. Everybody knows there are 6 million Jews that were killed by the Nazis. The Nazis also killed uh, 20 million Russians. Uh, there were 8 million Germans that were killed. You know, there were 400,000 Americans that were killed. It, when you add that up and Pol Pot killing 3 million Cambodians and the Chinese Communist Party killing oh. 20 million with the... Uh, when Genghis you add, Kong. Uh, for sure. Yeah. But when you just in the 20th century... Yeah. If you really look at the numbers, uh, we ended the 20th century with roughly six and a half billion people. And if you add up all of the people that ha started from 1901 to the year 2000, and then you take that 130 million deaths I I in there, it's not very likely at all, even in the middle of the 20th century when all of this bad stuff was happening, yeah. that you were going to die due to violence. Statistically speaking, it was it was so small yeah. in this time when we saw it all on video cameras. It's not yeah. like the first time it ever happened. Like bad stuff has happened throughout all of human yeah. history. Yeah. It just was recorded on video. Yeah. And so that's, again, perspective. And, and I think the problem is, is most people don't have the advantage of being able to look historically back and zoom out and right. look at like where we really are. They just think that right this second is the worst that it's ever been. When in reality, uh, I, I used to tell this, I almost got kicked out of uh, teaching Sunday high school kids in Sunday school because I asked them the first day I, I did this, this was 20 years ago. I said, <laughs> everybody raise your hand. If your parents have told you it's never been worse than it is right now. <laughs> and they all raise their hand. And I go, what if I told you there's more sex, drugs and rock and roll in the old Testament that there has ever been. <laughs> and they were like, what? <laughs> I'm like the only difference between like the year, you know, yeah. the year 3000 BC or well, when Moses was ro roaming around. And today is, uh, we have video cameras. That's the only yeah. difference. <laughs> everyone knows it. Yeah, and everyone knows yeah. it. Yes. Right. Like, uh, so, so that's kind of the perspective <laughs> that I have. And, uh, yeah, the church didn't like that one, by the way. <laughs> you can't say that. And I'm like, but is it true? Yeah. yeah. And you're talking to teenagers. Like, come on. I'm trying to relate here. Oh, but they, they went crazy. They Like, they'd show up at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I'd be like, I want to hear what that dude says. Yeah, it's different. It was way different. Yeah. Well, you know, like, back to that perspective thing, like, something I've kind of been, like, jamming on in my head recently is the power of emotion 
in life and in business as like a force like that propels things and not always forward, but in whatever direction that it, you know, that that motion is taking you in like a rudder to a boat. So like, for instance, you know, like if you're saying all of these negative things and you're believing them and you're just absorbing yourself or like letting your, like letting things absorb into you that create a perception of truth, that is the emotion that starts to propel you in whatever direction, you know, and I mean, it can be slower and heavier and harder, you know, but with that positive side, I mean, as silly as if I'm feeling uber confident, right? Like decide to wear like my huge stilettos that make me seven inches taller than I should be. I'm going to stop you right there. That'd be like every day then <laughs> that you're that confident. There is a uh, reason yeah. that I do that because it's like, because when you, you do, COVID, I'm kind of like, have- watch me. Like, yeah. let's go. Like, you know what I mean? But that emotion of like what days, I believe is possible. <laughs> two days you had COVID you that say. you were down and out and you had flip flops on. <laughs> Back to five foot three. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. On a good day. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Kicking, kicking it in the face. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. But I mean, you know, like that, but you, I think people feel like they are slaves to their emotions, but you can use it as an engine on purpose and do things and make choices about what you believe and what you decide to be a part of that then push you towards success or pull you away from it. You know, and I I don't think there's like enough voice given to like, you know, like what it does to people on the inside and the individual impact it has when they believe false narratives that are dangerous to their psyche. Yeah, I think it's it's even I, I want to build on top of that because there's an, a concept uh, that I learned a long time ago through actually my Sandler training, uh, and it's called IR theory, and it's identity versus role. And the concept with identity versus role is roles are what you do. So, Kyle, you're a husband, you're a business owner, you're a dad, uh, you're a friend, you're a son. There's it, you've when you're in your car, you're a driver. Uh, there's a million different roles. And if you look at uh, all of those roles in any given moment, you can grade yourself uh, on a zero to 10 scale, 10 is high, zero is low. Uh, And and within a single conversation, uh, you could be uh, one in one second, you could be uh, an eight as a dad, but then you tell your kid, no, they can't have the car for the weekend. And they may, you may feel like you're a two in a nanosecond. The idea of identity is that your identity is who you are stripped of all your roles. And the Mm. problem that I see today is that two things. One, uh, we tend to have, uh, we've tied our roles to our identity. And so that means you're going up and down with whatever it is. So I'll give you an example. Brett Farb, uh, one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history, uh, destroyer of the Chicago Bears, much to my chagrin. (laughs) And you're from Chicago. And I'm from Chicago originally. So to admit that, I like you already. Yeah. I'm just joking. Kyle, I have suffered as a I've suffered hey, as a Chicago Bears fan. I have a buddy from Chicago. Not to cut you off, but I'm no, 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 go ahead. To, and he says hey, his dad told him when he was young, "They're gonna let you down." This was after Peyton, uh, oh, yeah. Walter Payton. Oh, yeah. They go, this town right here, they're going to let you down. And this was before they win the uh, World Series, even the Cubs did. Yep. You know, he goes, everyone, he's sporting. It's, it's everyone. A, yeah. Anxiety. Way. Everyone. Yeah. But, you know, you think of like Brett Favre. He, he was an, uh, had an amazing career as a, the Packers murdered the Bears every time they played him. Uh, and he decided he was going to retire. And so he gave the NFL notice and they put him, uh, you know, on national TV a half dozen times every stadium that he went to whether it was in Lambeau Field or you know even the New York Jets uh, (laughs) they would sell out because they want to see Brett Favre play his last game against their team and he retired exactly for three months and then he went and played for the Jets for a couple years and then he retired again and he retired for three months and he went to play for the Minnesota Vikings until basically the NFL just beat him to a pulp and he couldn't do it anymore. And the reason is, is he couldn't imagine his life outside of being an NFL quarterback. Yeah, <clears throat> His identity and who he was was tied up into that. So what I see today is, is again, you've got to anchor your identity into something that doesn't move. So for me, it's my faith. I know that no matter how stupid I am in a role, my faith 
you know, I wake up in the morning and I go, I'm a 10 yeah. in my identity. And so no matter what noise is going on in the roles that I have, uh, my identity is protected. And the funny part is that you can only operate in any given role that's consistent with how you, gr you score yourself in your identity. So if your identity, if you're beaten to a pulp and you've tied your identity to, you know, something that moves all the time, like your emotions, like, you know, you look yes. at society today, right. we've, yes. killed, we've killed God and eliminated God. Yep. <clears throat> and so now it's, it's about, everything's about how you feel. Yep. So now everybody runs around and they have their identity anchored to nothing. And then they run around saying, oh, well, this is how I feel. And this is why I think you can't have a discourse, an actual discourse yeah. with anybody who believes, has different belief systems or ideas than you. Does that That's, make sense? Oh, oh my gosh. Totally does. That is huge. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely going to be doing some journaling and thinking on that because it's so important and it goes back to, because if you can be anchored to that, then you can pull yourself back to what do I know to be true? Unalterable about me, about life, about God, about the people that I love. Yeah. And you can find forgiveness for yourself, for other people. But I mean, all of a sudden you have a lot of power there because you are not at the mercy of everything buffet or, you know, buffeting you here, there and everywhere. So, I mean, I think that's, I mean, really, really amazing. It's removing everyone's personal opinion about you because yeah. you're going to take that to heart unless you can ground your foundation to something that's outside of that. And what would that be? Yeah. You know, there's not many things out there that you, a person can ground themselves to. Well, it's interesting you say that, Kyle, because it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, your faith. It could be something yeah. else that's immovable. Like you can say, I want to live a life of integrity. I'm going to tie my identity to okay. integrity or honesty or being genuine and authentic. And those are also things that now, again, okay. if you, you have your identity tied into that, uh, you can compare all of your different roles and all of the noise of the world and you can go, well, but am I still, I'm still going to live a life of this. And so you're, you've kind of insulate yourself away from the opinions, uh, the social media opinions of the mob of stupidity that comes in and yeah. says, you know, and they yeah. start yapping at you like a chihuahua. You, yeah. You're kind of like, I'm going to quack like a duck. It's going to roll right off my back. Nothing's going to bother me. Okay, so the application of this, because you had mentioned that this is part of Sandler and part of your day-to-day -day work, huh? Okay, so how do you apply that in sales training and executive coaching? Like, what? Because while that is profound to me as an individual and super interesting conversation and me and my journal later, what does it have to do with sales? And you know what I mean? Yeah. And like how people show up every single day. It kind of explain you know, what in their you do to life. everyone too uh, before that. I, well, we kind of yeah. looked right over. Well, I figured we, we will get into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. No, that's yeah. fair. Um, yeah. So, so I own a Sandler sales and training uh, performance organization company mm -hmm. here in Fort Worth. And what I basically do is I'm working with CEOs, presidents, and business owners who are, uh, struggling in some areas of their business and they want to improve them in regards to uh, hunting for new sales. Uh, sometimes their salespeople are dropping price in order to get new business. Um, maybe the pi sales pipeline isn't deep enough and consistently bleeding uh, new, new business. And so they'll come to me and they'll be like, can you do anything about that? And the question is maybe. And it depends on what I'm working with. You know, if you give me a bunch of, uh, you know, people that that uh, just literally came out of uh, the, the space-time continuum and showed up, uh, maybe not. And so the very first thing I would do is assess them, uh, you know, issue behavioral assessments to figure out how they're hardwired in terms of 29 different behaviors and, and if they have the motor for it, if they have the capacity for it. Uh, and then the sales training that I do, it's it's very much psychology based. And so, uh, that's, that's essentially what I do. Uh, lots of business consulting, lots yeah. of, uh, behavioral assessments, uh, lots of executive coaching. Uh, I think strategically quite well, I'm pretty agile on that, that side. Um, and I'm extremely well read. So I've read about 11,000 books in my lifetime. That's wow. literally the number. Wow. Do you, do you read them all or do you, I read, them all. I read everyone. Really? Really? Yeah. That's Absolutely. Amazing. It's yeah. spooky. And I remember it too, because I, I learn differently than most people. So 
most people will have a preferred way of learning. They'll, they'll either see it, they'll hear it, or they'll have to touch it and feel it. Yeah. So they call it vid, uh, visual, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. Right. I'm actually all three. Uh, if it's going to stick into my skull, I need to see it, say it, and then write it down. And so that's what I do when I'm reading books. I'll be like, oh, that's an interesting thing. I'll write it down. I'll say it, uh, you know, after I read it. And that's how it cements in my wow. skull. So that's, that's why I, I remember things. That's so how amazing. many journals do you have? Yeah. Uh, two. You, Only two. One's what? a gratitude journal. Okay. Uh, and, and there's an app on, you, you can get either through um, iTunes or through Samsung. And it's called Penzu, P-E-N-Z-U. And it's a free app, doesn't cost you anything. And every day before my feet touch the ground, in the morning, uh, the very first thing that I do is I, uh, I type out with my thumbs laying on my back, mostly in the dark, uh, what I'm grateful for. And then I type out three business goals that I'm going to accomplish that day and two personal goals that I'm going to accomplish that day. Every day. Every single day. I've done this for the last seven years I've done this. Okay. Before your um, feet hit the ground. I'll be, Gratitude I'll be I get. I'll be back in an hour. Oh, <laughs> you're killing me. I used to write down, you know, what, what I was going to do every day. And I'd map it out the day before, you know, and then double check it in the morning. It, you know, physically as well. I'd write down what t time I'm working out, what I'm going to do. Lately, it's been out the window with everything we've yeah, had going on, year. but I know it's coming right back. Yeah, Probably a week or two, I'm, yep. I'm going to be back in it. But I was just wondering, you. as much as you read and the way you learn, I was like, I bet this guy writes a ton of journals. But you don't really, you just keep simplicity. Yeah, uh, for sure. And to get things. Uh, there, I used to, the one thing that I think you can maybe call journaling. So for my three kids, I've got three kids, 21, 18, and then 18, almost 18. And uh, since they were born, the day they were born, uh, I hand wrote a uh, letter to them, you know, physically on notebook paper. <clears throat> and I just documented what's going on in the world today. I would get like a Chicago Sh Tribune and a Chicago Sun-Times paper on their the day they were born. Um, and then I started writing these letters out. Here's what's going on in the world. Here's what I think about being a new dad. And here's the, the, here's what I first thought the second I saw you. And I seal it up and, and, uh, put it in an envelope, numbered it, dated it, uh, never to be open until the day I croak when my kids, and wow. I do this four times a year, I do it each quarter. Whoa. Uh, I do it every quarter. So now like my 21 year old has, uh, you know, over 80, he's got 83, well, 82, letters written and it's documented his entire life so that's the only real journal like that's a diary that's huge wow but it's once a quarter it will be huge for them one day yeah. to know what is. you're thinking about them and the perception you have of what's going on in right. the world they're going to be able to absorb so much out of that wow. rather than just memory it's uh, documenting in real time without video yeah and, and, and it also gives me th the perspective of what's going through my head yeah. at the time. Like yeah. I mean, everybody says, oh, the terrible twos are awful. Well, for <laughs> my oldest kid, it was the freaking fours that were the ones <laughs> yes. that I, I'm like, I, I, like, this is why lions eat their young. Yeah. <laughs> I just hated the evens. Two was terrible. Four was terrible. And six was terrible. After that, you know, they're yeah. a different age. But yeah, like, I mean, the evens were terrible. <laughs> Oh, the evens. Oh, that's half of it. But that's that's how I, I so I don't do a, a lot of journaling other than that. Um, I don't. I write a lot. I do blog posts all the time. Yeah. Um, but that's different than journaling. Yeah. Uh, for me, journaling is is it's functional. It's not necessarily strategic. It helps me uh, stay focused on what I have to accomplish. It makes sure that I'm, it ensures that I stay balanced in my work and in mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think I did wrong in my first marriage is that I was all work and no life. And that's how I destroyed the marriage. I'll own, I'll own that piece. Yeah. Uh, and I don't say that proudly. I mean, that's something mm -hmm. that was maybe one of the biggest learning opportunities of my life was absolutely destroying that relationship yeah. because I was like, well, but if I only stay focused on these things, yeah. by the time I'm 40, I'll have, you know, $4 million and then I can put it on cruise control. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. Eh. yeah. 
You know, you, you, you talk and hear a lot of guys who have that drive, well, women as well, in the business world that have that mentality of, I'll go get it. Once I get it, it'll be fine. And when they look in the rear view mirror, everything's gone. Yeah. You know, they're like, whoa, what did yep. I just miss? You're My estranged from your kids. Gone. Yeah. Yep. And there's a price to pay for it. Balance yep. is crucial for sure. Almost got wrapped up into that. Um, then we called it quits, sold yeah. everything at, yeah. at one point in our lives. I think that's a good, you know, that's yeah. a good self-awareness on your part, again, because yeah. you averted the disaster well, well, that I wrote and tons of people walk into. Yeah. Because I, I had goals once from the time I was 14 years old. I started my first company and I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted a house in Vail. I wanted a house in London. I wanted a house in, in you know, in, in, uh, next to the the Biltmore estate in North Carolina, you know, I wanted lots of things. I wanted fast cars, Ferraris, and I wanted a, you know, I wanted a jet. I wanted to fly private everywhere. <laughs> and that's what I was solely and utterly focused on. There was, yeah. God was nowhere near, it, you know, his hand was everywhere, but I was like, uh, I was like Odie in the, <laughs> just running around like a dope. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's what it cost. And it was terrible. And so, you know, the second time around, I made sure that, that uh that's the balance the there. balance is there yeah. by a lot like yeah. i've readjusted everything so yeah it's a good way to be it's a hard pivot but now i mean it's funny because anytime like I, you know like when we catch up i mean you are immediately like the german's doing amazing <laughs> by the way he calls his wife the german <laughs> 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 um, my kids are incredible life is good i mean and it's interesting like hearing you say the very first thing you do is write out gratitude because i'm like literally the very first words out of your mouth anytime there's a reconnect is gratitude so i'm like oh my gosh like there it is like that's amazing yeah, the, the, the genesis behind the German, by the way. So my wife's name is Angela. She actually has a name. Uh, what? I call her Angie. The kids call her the German. But she is a, she's, a, you know, she's a German farm girl. I grew up in central Minnesota, 100% purebred German for like 10 generations. Uh, and she's, you know, when you drive BMWs, they say, ooh, it's the ultimate driving machine, right? And it's precision, everything, precision engineering. And that's, well, my wife, that's, she's precision engineering in every way, shape and form. That's awesome. <laughs> and so how I built her up is I built her up to, uh, to, to celebrate the fact that she's strong and beautiful and powerful and smart. And she's uh, unbelievably organized in all of the things that I could never be organized in because I'm like a ping pong ball. I'm all over the place. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel constantly. Does not sound <laughs> like it. Not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was right. like, wait a minute. Aren't you used to this? Hold on. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I get where you're coming from, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the genesis of where the German came from. It's, you know, uh, I actually said this out loud and somebody yelled at me, uh, uh, somebody yelled at me. I said, my, my wife is like, I call her my little panzer tank. And they were like, <gasps> and she was so, tri this woman was so triggered by this. Like, you can't call your wife a tank. I'm like, do you have any idea what a panzer tank was? Like, it was the t baddest ass thing that there ever was in yeah. world war ii you yeah. needed like three sherman tanks american yeah. sherman tanks to take out one of these things yeah. it was indestructible in so many different ways it was one of the fiercest things other than the t-72 soviet tank it was one of the most fierce things on the battlefield and of course that's what i would call my wife and there, it, but after a second i was like Oh, maybe uh, maybe a maybe a girl doesn't want to be tank. called. Yeah, yeah, got it. Maybe Size, she doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I stopped calling her my Panzer tank. But yeah. is she now? Did, was she born and raised in Minnesota? You know, yeah. or she came? Okay. Yeah. So she she's German, but she doesn't live the life of correct. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So I I, I I over the last three years have my son is fluent in German and Spanish, and he's the one who just graduated college. And so my goal three years ago was instead of giving him money or, you know, saying, Hey, attaboy, you know, congratulations. My goal was I was going to take him to Germany, uh, for a month. And I was going to speak only fluent German with him as we toured all over Germany. So for the last three years, I have been working on an app called Duolingo 
And so I think my vocabulary now is about 4,000 German words. I'm, I, I can get around. You can get around for I can, sure. Like I can watch German. I can watch Dark, which is on Netflix, and it's in German. And I don't even need to like have German subtitles anymore. Wow. I can just watch them and listen. And really? I can, I can wow. follow along with it. She had a um, – she um, practiced German in college. I'm I'm a, ambition. Ambition. <laughs> little. Yeah. Das ist gut. Das ist gut. Das ist all. Yeah. <laughs> Nine more. That's amazing. Oh, I got a funny story. I got it through Germany back we then. We were together. <laughs> we were together uh, dating at the time oh, for the 96 right. Olympics that were in Atlanta. We yeah. both lived there at the time. And so we go down there to celebrate. We I don't know if we went to an event that night or just went out to hang out, you know, at, it, so many people. It was a blast. And um, and I was just like, you know, we keep running into people. You can tell foreigners, they always ask us questions. They can tell we're local. And I go, well, won't you just start speaking in German? So she does. Happened to be two Germans that asked in English and she started speaking German nice and she was getting called out like where are you from over there? and I'm picking up I'm just nodding my head uh-huh. you know I'm just playing yeah. I'm like I'm not even going down this road you they're gonna call me out in a second <laughs> you know you're not getting an accent I'm not pulling that one off yeah at all absolutely after about five minutes she goes they go where are you from she goes Right here in Atlanta, Georgia, just plain as day. No, <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious. Like, we'll buy you a beer anyway. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite vacations ever was. I think it was like 1998. Um, we, I did my first German vacation, and we went to, uh, we flew into Koblenz, Germany, in the Rhine Valley. And we stayed in castles in the Rhine Valley for a few days, ended up going to a city uh, called Rotenburg, which is a walled city. And it's it's an ancient city that uh, the locals have tons of butt hurt over because uh, in World War II, even though it had no strategic value, the Americans bombed the snots out of this ancient city and just basically flattened it. Oh, oh wow. It was yeah. bad bad yeah. but we ended up going to, to munich and we're there during oktoberfest which obviously starts in september and my one of my favorite things was i had a steina beer that was as big as my head and this little this uh this this waitress the kelnerin she walks out she had like four of them in each it's hand it's amazing i'm like the beer weighs more than it's she does. It's amazing. I literally don't know how they do that with their hands like and I saw this one woman like carrying a circle of them. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, she's smaller than I was. I was like, what? They, is they going need to become on? fighters. Anyone <laughs> can have strong hands like that and be that small, pound for pound. I'm betting on them. This is what one, I, you I'm know. married a German, and I'm yeah. telling you, you sleep with one eye open. Because yeah. if she slips around my neck, it's yeah. over. Yeah. You're gonna squeeze me like a chicken. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so. I'm going to take a left and go back to Sandler. So tell us the story of how you got here, like your career and kind of your trajectory. Because I think everybody listening has got a sense of well-read, strategic, you know, and like your personality. But what was the pathway? Like all of those natural orientations, like, you know, how did, how did you get here? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. You know, I started my, I've always been interested in material things. It started out material. Um, my parents got divorced when I was 13 years old. When I was 14, I was like, I got to get out of the house. This is awful. <clears throat> and so I, I lied to get a job at a grocery store. That lasted for only a couple of weeks until they figured out, yeah, I was really – and when I was 14, it looked like I was about nine. So it, oh. they, oh. fi- they figured it out real quick. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and then I decided, uh, you know what? I don't want to make $2.35 an hour minimum wage. I'm going to start – doing something. And so on a dot matrix printer, I printed out a bunch of uh, flyers and I went, drove my bike over to the rich side of town. And I said, look, for 50 bucks, I will clean your house. I'll vacuum, I'll dust, I'll mop, I'll scour all the bathrooms, the kitchens, the whole, this, that, and whatever. And it worked. The first time I went out, two people said yes. And nice. so wow. I was like, yeah. now I also don't like to clean. <laughs> so I had a dilemma. Yeah. And so that's how I hired my first uh, employee was I dragged one of my buddies in and I said, Hey, if I give you five bucks an hour, yeah. would you help me do this? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, 
why don't you bring your little brother? I'll give him five bucks an hour. And all of a sudden we were, we started a business. Well, that grew into something that paid my way through private high school. No kidding. Uh, no, I kid you not. And so I, you paid your own way through high school yeah. at that point. Yeah, you're like, so. I'm done with parent. You know, I'm going to do my own thing right now. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Well, and I also had a younger brother and younger sister. My parents are only about 18, 19 years uh, older than me. Mm -hmm. And so when they got divorced and I was 13, they were like 32. Yeah. Yeah. And they were free for the first time in their whole lives. And so both of them were like, pate. Oh, God. Yeah. And they, so, uh, you know, I was all of a sudden in charge of groceries and cooking and doing laundry and all the stuff that a 13 year old boy really never nah. wants to do. Right. Uh, and I figured, you know what? I'm not going to wait for a box of Cheerios and some, you know, some chopped up fruit to show up. I'm going to go make the money so I can do it. And that's what yeah. I did. That's wow. amazing. And it worked out pretty good. Yeah. It, it, so you started your business, paid your way through private high school. Yep. Um, so what was your next step after that? Do you sell the business? You know what? I sold the, the, the cleaning business because it ended up being a, a juggernaut. Wow. Yeah. I ended up with something that was sellable. Wow. Yeah. Sold it to, um, to a, a Polish couple that I had met. Uh, at the second phase of my career, and that was I started dating this uh, I started dating this girl whose dad had a printing shop, and he was always complaining that he couldn't get reliable labor to run the various printing presses. And I said, "Why don't you teach me?" And he said, "Okay." Well, I ended up running three of them, and at the time, uh, he would pay me ten bucks an hour per machine. So I was running three, making thirty Ooh, bucks an hour. Yeah, yeah. and it was kind of cool because uh, he would pay me time and a half at forty, uh, double time at fifty, and I was working like sixty hours a week and going to school at the same time. Whoa! So I was making more money than my parents combined, which is not a brag; it's just a fact yeah. of yeah, what yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, and so I really dug that. You know, I, I th that was the next thing, and then I went to college and continued to do that stuff, paid my way through private college, yeah. zero student debt. Yeah. But I also didn't get to experience college at all because right. I was yeah. working 60 hours a week and going to school yeah. full time. So it, it was, it was brutal, but uh, you know, you look at kids these days and they're like, we got $200,000 with a student loan debt and I'm a barista making 15 bucks an hour. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's a difficult situation. I, I have an issue with that. Um, I, not to stop you short, no, 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 go ahead. one of one of our sons uh, went to a community college here. He was during the COVID and stuff. He's yeah. like, why would I sit in a dorm room, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, why don't more kids do this? I think the largest check I wrote for a whole semester was $525. I love it. A whole it. semester. You and bet. He, full courses. Yep. You know, full He has load. put so much money in his bank account. Yep. And, and he has worked. learned so much about money and life and yep. Independent. He found a great job here. He's done a great his job. Bank rolled a lot of money, saved it, and now his next two years will be paid for at University of Arkansas. Awesome. And I'm going, why don't more kids, why are they going this far into debt? I understand medical school, but when you graduate with a degree in being a doctor or something, you're going to make that money back quick. Right. We're talking about different degrees that you know is going to take years mm -hmm. to pay off, yeah. but you didn't have to go that route. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I know. And I think we should be making, we should be encouraging our children to get, uh, you know, real, uh, real degrees. Um, and, you know, I, I just finished reading one of the books. I read a book a week on average. Uh, one of the books that I read about a month ago was Up From Slavery, which is the autobiography of Booker T. Washington. Mm. <clears throat> Fascinating stuff. I the bet. guy literally was born a slave, grew up a slave. Uh, you know, Civil War ended and he, you know, ended up working as like a seven-year-old in uh, Pennsylvania coal mines and whatever, making nothing <clears throat> just to have subsistence for the family and then ended up m figuring out how to get his way to uh, a school that a white civil war general Confederate civil war general started for black, for black, uh, the uneducated black people. Amazing. And what was interesting about it was what he did was he didn't get into the soft, mushy things of who are going to become a sociologist, which is, again, it's a science and I, I get it. But what he was teaching these kids and these people in this school was um, how to farm, how to uh, build things, how to like actual skills, skills. that are in demand. 
Yep. Actual yeah. skills. Yep. And the and the and the and the people who would graduate out of this stuff had like marketable skills so they can go out into this world and earn a living. And and it was awful in the South, make no no bones about it. Post antebellum uh, civil war was horrific. It was terrible through Jim Crow. It was awful all the way through probably uh, you know, post World War II. There's no question that all of those things were awful. Um, but if you look at how kids today, they go into these mushy, like I'm going to go get a, you know, a degree in gender studies, or I'm going to go get a degree in lesbian dance theory or whatever it is that they decide to do. And what are you actually going to do with that besides be a professor for lesbian dance theory? I mean, seriously, (laughs) you you can't do anything with it except for serve, go to Starbucks. And then you're mad because you have like a lifetime worth of student debt. It's more than your first house probably is going to cost. You're never going to get rid of it. And, and somehow, you know, like my kids have all made different decisions and you want my kids to pay for that? No, sorry. Well, and you know, I mean, I think like things have gotten so complicated and confused in people's minds. You're allowed to be passionate and interested and curious about lots of things, but if they're not in demand and they don't provide service and value to someone else, they don't, you don't get paid for it because there is no value, no monetary value in that. And that is just true. Yeah. It's not mean, like it's not weird. You know, you can go study lesbian dance theory. Be passionate about that. Knock sure. yourself out. Read everything. Be the preeminent. But if nobody will pay for it, nobody will be paid for right. it. So you got to have something else, you know, and like you can have a passion and a hobby and interest and a job. And and Dacia, I mean, think about this. It's like, the ROI. Yes. It boils down to that. Yes. So what's sure. your return on investment? And you have to view college that way. Now, as expensive it is, as it is, it's, um, they have to take that in effect. They should be teaching that in high school instead of what school Constantly. you're going to go to. Oh, that's great. You right. got accepted the so-and-so. They don't teach what are you going to do with that. Not usually. That's right. up to you. Well, and, and think about this. It, you know, it's high school and even college curriculum. Uh, there are a handful of schools in the entire country that teach you sales. Everything in the world is sold to you. Yes. The shoes, your yeah. stiletto, your yep. high heels, <laughs> exactly. giant stormtrooper boots <laughs> exactly. that make seven inches taller. <laughs> like those were sold to you. The haircut that I got this afternoon. Everything. Everything is sold. The canopies yes. that you, oh, I chose the canopies. Eh. They were sold to you by someone. Ideas. Yeah. Everything. Everything. Through actual sales or marketing or both of them yes. combined. Yes. It's one of the two. Yep. Psychologically or yes. uh, physically. Yeah. Or, well, and whatever. sales and marketing are actually intertwined. Yeah. Yes. Dacia, we, you and I have talked about this yeah. a lot. Oh, my God. Yes. I go into companies all the time, and they're, 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 the salespeople are like, oh, marketing sucks. Yeah. They didn't do anything. Yeah. And I'm like, eh, but they did bring things in, and you just didn't close them, stupid. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I was on the sales side for a while, and oh, we, yeah. we envy, you know, it was like, marketing, what are they doing here? <laughs> like, I'm not going to get patted on the back if they take all the credit for this. It was me you sold it in. Yeah. Sales them. always gets But when you look back on it, yeah. it's like, what helps sell that product? Yep. Their marketing, you know, along with the personality or whatever that helps For get sure. the product in. But yep. the marketing sells it inevitably. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. That's a longevity of products is marketing. But Not and a- if you think of like in the world that we live in, everything is sold and there's never, uh, there's never a shortage of qualified, good, effective salespeople. Never. They're always searching. I call them unicorns, the top performers, yeah. the ones that have a process and follow that process and yep. deliver consistent results regularly. They're disciplined. They have a process at all times. And those are so few and far between that, again, if you just taught a college class, like here's sales 101, yeah. 201, 301, 401, and help, that would be a, a marketable skill that I would tell every kid on planet, just take that. Just take it, even if you're going to be yeah. a, you know, a doctor. Because guess what? If you're a doctor, you yeah. still have to sell your skills yeah. and your, your service. Have a minor in exactly. sales and in whatever else right. you're passionate about and want yep. to really focus on. Um, the finance is another one. Like if oh, you're yeah. going to run your business oh, yeah. or anything, I... We, we, oh, yeah. she would, you know, uh, mentor up at UNT, um, University of North Texas. Yep. And, you know, some of the kids would come up afterwards and do Q and A's and, you know, and I'd talk to him, what are you, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. You know, I'm freshman and sophomore 
And I said, hey, I didn't know either. But I said, the one thing that I can guarantee you'll use is some type of financial education yeah. if you want to, because a lot of them are there to be entrepreneurs or whatever. Yep. I go, you have to know this. There's no way around it. Yep. I go, you can have the best idea, the best business until you learn cash flow, until you learn these things. It's not going to work. This is why small businesses fail. Yeah. You know, it's because you don't know how to use them, operate the money that you're making. Yeah. It was the first thing that I did when I went to college. I, my degree is in accounting, actually. Oh, yeah? I was about yeah. to ask. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Like nerd. Oh, yeah. no. I love it. Yeah. But starting my first business when I was 14, yeah. like I had to run a checkbook and I had to yeah. buy yeah. supplies and I had to pay people. And with those people, I had to pay you know, employment tax, unemployment tax. As a I teenager. Just, as, as a Good Lord. 14 year old. Yeah. And, and so it's amazing. You, you had to know those types of things. And yes. for me, you know, I'd watched a, an uncle uh, in law start a business in contracting. And then he, he, he was an artist. He, he did stuff like here with the crown molding and he, he would build these beautiful things. And you're like, Oh, you're the Picasso of carpentry. Uh, and he went broke. And he went broke and ended up in debt to the Internal Revenue Service and yeah. ended up whacking him his house and all yeah. this other stuff. And as I watched this as a 12-year-old, because I was working for him in the summers as a 12-year-old, I was like, I never want yeah. that to happen to me ever in my entire life. And that's why at, well, 13, I'm like, I'm going to get an accounting degree yeah. for exactly that reason. Well, I mean, I, I this is going to sound arrogant, but it's not. I mean, the reason that our firm is effective is because of exactly what both of you are talking about. Like is founded on a backbone of entrepreneurship. So our entire team looks at everything. Like if this was our business yep. and we talk in the language of business, we talk financials and how that connects with marketing and what's happening. We have those conversations with clients about, is it really working? Where's the breakdown? And it was founded on the back of a person that was a salesperson for over a decade. <laughs> you know? So it's like, it, so I could not agree more with what you guys are saying because it's about the language of how value moves through the world and through business. And if you can sell something and you understand how money flows, there you go. It gets way like, easier, it gets doesn't way it? Way easier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What were the biggest uh, challenges that you? Uh, you have had to overcome as you launched blend, the blender, uh, the, the blender organization. How, tell me what that looked like for you. Me. Um, so what I mean by that is I am not a micromanager, which is a blessing, but there was a period of time where I just would love a person and their culture fit so much that I was not good at the accountability side, you know, and matching, the role and like what they should be doing and understanding like the metrics of that performance. Um, and also org charts, right? So like I understood money, but not like how Kyle understands money. And so I would hire to solve a problem without backing it up, um, saying, okay, um, is this what the organization needs to to thrive long term, and so I'll give you a perfect example. Um, there was a period where I had more support staff on salary than doers. That's dangerous, and I could not see it. I couldn't see it because I hired them to solve problems that were problems for me. Versus, okay, wait, why are those problems actually there? Do they need a person to solve them? And like, what does the business actually need to have from a staff and a talent standpoint to drive revenue? And so it was the people piece, the people component, like how do the numbers match the people? How does the leadership style and accountability match the people? Because I can sell and I can market and I can understand money. But man, that middle part of yeah. like, where do the humans and it, it, in my baggage and my blind spots just always land squarely on the people pleasing people side where I really lose the forest for the trees. I mean, that was why it was so beneficial when Kyle came in because he could respect the blessing of my 
tendencies, right? Like the good side of, you know, being people oriented and people first, sure. but also be able to say, and here's the facts. <laughs> and now we're going to walk through those together it, it, it's, and we're going to make a little more structured decisions around people than you have done yeah, in the past. It really, and our people are amazing because of it. Yeah. It really sucked sitting on the sidelines watching this. Cause at that time <laughs> I, I wasn't part of the business. So just on the weekend sitting around having, you yep. know, How's it going? Where are we going from here? Blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, they, she hired great people. She hired people who were professionals at the role they were given. Yeah, they're amazing. It was just too early for the yeah. business to yeah. hire that person for that role. Yeah. That's why I say it was me. It was not yeah. them. It was me. And, yeah. um, you know, and to be honest, she didn't want to hear that. No, you I know, because I, I would talk to her. I was like, you know, when you break down calls per employee and what they produce, I go, th this isn't going to work. I go, there's not enough work to support them. And yep. you know, I had to line it all out. It was, you know, she still didn't want to believe it. Yeah. You know, she's like, but this is the person we're going to need. I go, that's too far down the road. We don't have cash to operate on until we get there. Yep. You know, yep. we yeah. got to cut ties. Yep. It's, yeah. it's interesting how common I, I see this all the time. And you, you have the additional complexity of well you're married <laughs> there's no hiding yeah yeah there's no hiding yeah. We, <laughs> it's taken years to make that work yeah we, we, have um, to, we do it on purpose yeah and we yeah. still have to work at it yeah um for sure you yep. know no I, I you know i see this a lot and the idea is that you know you want this infrastructure so you bring in all these sales and but you've got the infrastructure and the capacity to to deliver that's okay, but you have to look at your burn rate of cash and mm -hmm. yeah. go, okay, well, I'm going to run out of cash in like 11 months and therefore I need to, you know, do something. And it's like an equalizer on a old 80s stereo. You've got to yeah. like pump this up and dial this down and you got to find that right mix. And uh, unfortunately, I see this a lot of times with entrepreneurs who have a nice wad of cash to sit, sit on where they're like, ah, I'll get, I'll get there. I'll get there, but they don't. Yeah. And you know, this is part of the sales training. I'll, I'll teach people. I'm like, look, <clears throat> you've got to have a goal. You have to set up your goals. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, I want to be rich. That's not yeah. a goal. It'd right. be nice to have so-and-so. <laughs> yeah. And right. I know in five years I'll get there. Right. You, you got to line them out. You measure, you write them down, have them like a roadmap is what we call it. Yeah. That. Well, and, and I actually just started teaching a class in our sales mastery class this morning. Um, we do sales training, uh, mastery, sales mastery every Wednesday from eight to nine 30. And I asserted that if you don't have goals, you're not going anywhere. And I actually shared with the class today that in 1979, Harvard University did a survey of all of their MBA, uh, MBA students. And they said, how many of you are, have written goals and an action plan to achieve those goals? And the answer came back and 3% of them had written goals and, and a plan. 13% of them had unwritten goals and plans and 84% had none of the above. Fast forward 10 years, they looked back and they realized that the 3% that had written down their goals and had an action plan earned 10 times more than the other 97% combined. Wow. But there's a second piece to this that I don't think a lot of people know. The 13% that had unwritten goals, but they still had goals or made double what the 84% that had nothing, uh, no goals at all. And, and so I guess the moral of the story is, is that if you don't have goals in whatever it is you're going to do, I don't care if it's sales or, or entrepreneurship or finance, if you don't know where you're going to go, you don't have a plan and you don't track them daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, mm -hmm. annually, if you don't have a five-year plan, you're literally going to be like a rudderless ship in the middle of the ocean. You're going to get tied through, you're going to get pulled through every current uh, whether you like it or not, and you're reactive in your life. And for me, I will not have any of that. I want to know, I know where I want to go. I know what behaviors I have to execute to get there. Um, and I measure myself constantly in order to, to, to do that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, so I used to set 
you know, always quantifiable goals. And what I ended up finding emotionally for me is that they ended up feeling like a beat down. Um, I would set them slightly too high and I believe in stretch goals, but then the stretch goals were such emotional, like, I mean, just self brutalization. Like it was ridiculous. Like on the inside, what I would do. And eventually I learned I needed to balance. So I still have quantified goals. Don't get me wrong. Like I want to get some shit done, but like I realized I had to have for my personality softer goals, like more core, you know, like calling core value orientation where I could, it kind of goes back to identity where I could say, no matter what the numbers are saying, I am confident. I am moving forward in that. And I am creating a business world and a, you know, human connections that are advancing who I want to be as a person and what I believe about the world and about people at large. And so, and I, I have them framed on my desk, you know, and they're about our marriage. They're about the boys. They're about what I want this organization to teach the world about work and about significance inside of work, you know, no matter what your title is. And there's quantified goals on there too. Like, you know, but, but I've realized like I had to find my balance. Like I use smart goals. We build roadmaps. Like we're very disciplined around that. We do it for our clients, but then I also had to have the other stuff in order to keep me sane. Like it was kind of weird. So like for you, how do you define goals? Like, is it the smart goal? Like, what do you mean by that? So I think you just hit the home run of the podcast on that one because uh, I'm a balance guy. And so literally my goal is to uh, maximize my revenue. I'm not even going to say because it it's obnoxious, but I only want to work 35 hours a week doing it. Nice. And I'm not going to compromise nice. if it's beyond that. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> because for me, um, it's incremental costs. Like, you know, it, it's, it's the opportunity cost for me to work that extra, say, 35 to 50 hours. Uh, how much extra money can I make? But then what the hell am I going to do with it? I'm going to, I'm turning 53 next week. Um, I have a wife, uh, the German that I like to climb mountains with. Yeah. yeah. I would, it, there's not at any point in my life. Am I going to sit there and go, you know, on my deathbed as I'm, you know, just got run over by a busload of cheerleaders and that's how I'm going to die. Um, <laughs> College cheerleaders. Huh. Yeah. College cheerleaders. <laughs> and do they fall out of the bus while they're running over you? Or how's it yes. work? Oh, yes. okay. Absolutely. I think I've had that dream. <laughs> on the <journey>. balls, <laughs> cut it out. <laughs> You're going to have to edit that one out. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as I'm laying on my deathbed, there's not at any point am I going to go, you know, man, I really wish I would have closed that extra 100K of business, uh, you know, with, uh, with that publicly traded company. I'm not. What I'm going to want is I'm going to want to do what we're doing. We're leaving next Thursday, or no, I'm sorry, next Wednesday. The Germans kidnapping me, uh, and we're taking a direct flight to St. George, Utah. We're going to go uh, do Angels Landing oh, wow. uh, in Zion National Park, yeah. and we're going to be there for four days. Uh, we're going to do a sunset ATV tour for one of the days. She rented e-bikes. So we're going to be all over the park. We're going Love to go it. on. We're oh. going to hike a hundred miles in the four days. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm on board with that. So, so in regards to my goals, uh, my goals are in terms of mind, body, and spirit, okay. and also uh, business, professional, uh, and I break them all down. So I've got a million kinds of goals. Uh, you know, what kind of dad do I want to be? What ty type of Christian do I want to be? What kind of husband do I want to be? What kind of friend and family member do I want to be? I have goals for all of those. Uh, and then I have all the normal business goals, you know, I yeah. make a shit pile of money yeah. and I want to go party a lot. That's basically <laughs> what I want. <laughs> Like, you know, <laughs> I work so I can go have fun. Yeah. That's kind of what it yeah. is. But but I don't want to just go work and like, you know, do coke lines and off of strippers butts. I just <laughs> yeah. I want to go hang out with the German. Yeah. That's yeah. literally yeah. what I want to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, s s some people will say, "Oh, well, maybe you're not motivated." Oh no, I'm absolutely motivated yeah. because what I want to accomplish with the German in my private life is Massive stuff. Yes. It's yeah. just massive stuff. Yeah. So the goals are humongous. And yes, you have to chunk them down. And they're all smart goal associated. And so 
you know, again, I, I know I'm being a little crude and rude, but in the end, yeah, my goals are, they're all smart goals, but it's, it's in 15 different areas. Oh, that's for awesome. People, that, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. For people who don't realize and, um, set out your personal goals, say it may be hiking a hundred miles in four days. If they've never done that, they don't know how rewarding that is oh, and how long amazing. that stays with you and how that pushes you when you get back to accomplish goals in your professional life as well. Yes. I've hiked uh, like 14 or uh, 14,000 feet elevation in the mountains and that. And uh, my first one happened to be during a blizzard nice. on accident. It was like at the very end of September, early October. I can't remember exactly. And my brother-in-law at the time was like, hey, you ever hiked a 14 or, you know, we mountain bike, do all these things. And I'm like, no. What are you talking about? He goes, let's do it before the winter time hits. It happened to get snowed on. This is a story of its own. Brutal. But oh, it was yeah. the most life-changing, one of the life-changing things I've ever done to where I'm like, oh, I need to set <clears throat> these out there. You know, me and my son backpack, you know, set out like a, a, a three-day trip hiking over 40 miles, you know, those type of things. Yeah. And when you accomplish them, um, trail running, that type of thing with teams. Um, I love doing that type of stuff. But you, you have to prepare. You have to train for them. You have to organize it. You have to go do it. You have to weather the conditions. And then you come back and you're like, once you apply that in your business, for somebody who hasn't done it, I encourage them to really go do th- something outside of their comfort zone um, cause we enter those things in our business life all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you right. mentioned setting your goals in, in business earlier, probably like 15 minutes ago. And if you don't have those goals, you'll run around chaotic and you'll make gut or emotional decisions. You can do that with a lot of cash in your pocket or broke. Yes. And they're both yeah. not good. Cause you, you see got, um, right now we're getting ready to launch something that we're getting ready to throw a decent amount of money at for us. It's kind of a risk, but it's a drawn out, organized risk to us where we go, all right, now here's the plan for this. This is a 18 month runway of X, Y's and Z's. This is how it should roll out. This is what we're looking at and hoping for. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, we know. We'll adjust. All right, we adjust and go from there. Yeah. Um, And if you don't have money and then you're making decisions off gut reactions, that can be detrimental as well. Of course, you don't have money in general to make decisions that you can afford to lose. But those are the type of things where you're like, I'm selling now. I can't hang on. I, whatever. I'm like, oh, no, 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 back up. There's ways to move stuff around. You've got two more months under this. Um, yeah. What you have right now, we just got to move the money around. Yep. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. I think too many people fear failure. And yeah, I teach this all the time. I, I'm like, look, when I ask a room full of people, <clears throat> I'm like, when I, when I say this word, I want you to say out loud the first thing that comes to mind. And I'll say failure. And everybody's like bad, negative, terrible, awful, you know, cry, you know, all these negative things. <clears throat> and I said, it's interesting that you say that because the way I look at failure is this. Failure is only the emotion that you assign to it. And I also said, here's the second piece. All learning only happens through failure. Like you mm-hmm. cannot learn something by not, by, by getting it right the first time. So yeah. I know everybody knows uh, Kim Jong-un, <clears throat> the dictator in North Korea. Yeah. And yeah. they said on his very first try at a bowling alley, he bowled 300. Oh, yeah. Did you hear about his golf? No, uh, what, do you, what do you do? Five oh, holes? Uh, 18 holes in one? Uh, yeah, it was something <laughs> absurd. Shot a 40-something. Or nice. It was, it was like, <laughs> yeah. what? Yeah. Hold on a minute. His That's ha- not possible. His hairdo alone disqualified yeah. him from ever being <laughs> good at anything, really. Yeah. <laughs> you can only be a dictator by having that haircut. <laughs> yeah, right. For sure. But, but, you know, I mean, think about it. it, it no learning at all happens uh, without failure. And so the, the real question that I have for people is, should you redefine your def- well, should you redefine failure? So for me, failure is something it sounds obnoxious, but failure is the a- achievement of a goal that's different from the one you set out to achieve in the first place. Mm. Neither good nor bad. Mm. You either learn from it or you or or you try it again in, in, in a different way. And again, I go back to the equalizers on the stereo. You know, maybe you have to up this a little bit and you pull that down. And I'm I would never advocate well, quit on the first try unless it's 
skydiving and you didn't pack your <laughs> definitely don't fail at that one on no. the first try because you won't get a second. But almost, you know, nothing in life happens uh, instantaneously on the first try. Uh, you've got to be able to replicate it. And and so Michael Jordan, you know, didn't even make the high school basketball team until he was a junior. Um, you know, Thomas Edison failed at the light bulb 10,000 times before he got it. <clears throat> got it right. And that's kind of my point is that uh, I think it's John C. Maxwell wrote a book called uh, Failing Forward. Mm-hmm. One of the greatest books I ever read in my life. And he asserted it's the same thing. <clears throat> I think that's where I stole it from. So. Mr. Maxwell, don't yell at me for this one. <laughs> yeah. I'm giving you kudos. Yeah. But I mean, all all learning happens only with failure. You don't learn squat. If you got it right on the first try, well, you're probably lucky. But what did you really learn? You never learned how to come through adversity. You never had, had to be persistent. You never had to think critically like, well, did I really get lucky at that and just get it right the first time? Or is there maybe a better, more efficient way of doing yeah. that? And, and, and so you only get those things through failure. And that's why I tell, you know, in terms of IR theory and how you apply that to sales, I know I never answered that question, but you think about this, salespeople get told no all the time, a yeah. hundred times a day. Oh yeah. A uh, hundred times a day. So if your identity of who you are is tied into your performance as a salesperson on any given level, you're dead. It's over. It's over. But if you have your identity separated from your role as a salesperson and your identity is tacked at, say, an 8, 9, or a 10, like high, uh, no matter what's going on, you, you're going to go through a slump. There's no such thing as a, a salesperson. The greatest yeah. salesperson right. in the history of the world has gone through a, a slump where they just suck. Yep. yep. And, and if you yep. say, oh, I suck because my sales suck, uh, that's, that's exactly the opposite way. You are going to, like, nosedive kamikaze style right yes. into that into the into the ground and so that's where that's where that that plays out because you have to have the the emotional intelligence the iq to understand if you peg it to something that doesn't move whatever that is um everything is just a season so you can have a bad season with your kids with your spouse with your friends your family not everything is going to be what i call shits and giggles all the time it's just not going to happen it's not even reasonable it kind of be boring if you didn't have right. some struggle in your life in some way shape and form um and and so you know again this is why i think it's so important as a salesperson in particular but you know 3x that as a business owner, as a husband, like if your identity is tied high up, you know, at an eight, nine or a 10, um, what happens if your kids get sick or, you know, your wife gets COVID or whatever it is. And, you know, maybe one of those roles starts taking a nosedive. You're going to be able to make, be strong and consistent and focused through it. Uh, and, and that's important. I think that's, yes. for me, it's, it's an anchor that I can't let go because, uh, life is a series of well seasons yeah. that come and go quickly. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So I've just got to go back and like pull this back in. So college accounting, then take us through like, you know, what, what job did you get after having been an entrepreneur since 14 years old and working your tail off? Uh, you're going to laugh when I say it. So uh, I got an accounting degree and uh, at the time I graduated DePaul university in what 92, I think it was, um, everybody in their right mind in their right mind wanted to go to work for Arthur Anderson. Right. And I was like, Nope, don't want to go work for Arthur Anderson. I had an offer from Arthur Anderson, uh, again, 1992, uh, they said $36,000 a year, get an expense account. We're going to, fly all over God's green earth, doing audits, uh, financial audits all over God's green earth, you know, all expenses paid benefits, the whole nine areas. And I was like, it's just, that sounds horrific to me. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I actually found a, a little tech company in Lake Forest, Illinois called blue feather communications, blue feather communications. And, uh, it was a, a company that made, it was, it was pretty cutting edge at the time. And what they did was they made uh, animated video for HR companies instead of talking head. So just think of uh, if you wanted to increase the participation rate of a 401k for a fortune 1000 company, uh, they would either give you a manual or they would have like somebody in HR do a video and be like, this is what happens, whatever, yeah. you know, and if you, whatever. And, and so 
what what they did was they decided we're going to keep. Cute, by the way, <laughs> but I, if no one's watching that, well, actually, uh, the vocals are good. I, I can tell you, I can tell you for who, sure who's yeah. going to be shooting arrows at me. Be like Comanches, they're going to be coming after me everywhere. <laughs> you just did a girl impression. Yeah. <laughs> That's love terrible. It, love it. Um, but uh, uh, but but we created these things digitally, and so and we actually had the voice of Tony the Tiger. No kidding, as the the voiceover. Nice. And he would read the script and say, "Hey, welcome to uh, the William Wrigley Company 401k. This is how it works." And and they'd talk about the funds and this, that, and whatever. And they'd have the graphics come up. Well. Any time that the, the the graphics or the plan would change, say the match went from say two to percent to three percent or whatever, you wouldn't have to do anything other than send the video back to us the the hard the hard drive. We'd put it in, put new graphics in there instead of having to reshoot a whole new video. Yeah, and we were able to do it in in blocks and units, and from there, you know, I got involved with that because I thought, oh, that's cool, and then I started thinking. You know, there's not a lot of money in HR. What if we got involved with stuff like, um, you know, uh, other things, sales and other training videos? And what if we did this? And we, and so, you know, I started creating ISO 9000 videos and t uh, total quality management, TQM. And I, I started expanding the library out. And while I started as the assistant bookkeeper, three years later, I was the chief operating officer and I owned a third of the company because wow. I took zero in salary for three years. Wow. <clears throat> I took stock. Yeah. And then we got bought out. Oh, wow. And it worked. No hey, joke. That's <laughs> early. Before you were 30? Oh, no, that was oh, way before. No, yeah, I know. I 26. 26. 26. Wow. And you're like, hmm. Huh. So yeah. how many goals did that buyout accomplish what you thought when you were 14? You know, uh, well, not uh, realistic goals, not a house in London. Tokyo, yeah, you know. it, it didn't do that. But yeah, uh, I, I mean, I was way up the food chain in terms of yeah. achieving what I th what, what my goal was. Like yeah. I set the goal yeah. and I was like, oh, OK, well, I'm way above that one. Oh, that's awesome. So, so four so or 30. Out. Yeah. Yeah. But from there, that's when I started construction companies because my dad had had a stroke. Uh, he had a stroke when he was 40. Oof. Uh, and he couldn't do what he was doing. And I was like, <clears throat> okay, he, he had a long recovery for that. He had a short term memory problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, he was only able to work, uh, as a cashier in a shell station, a gas station in the suburbs of Chicago. And it occurred to me, I'm like, man, this guy's working the third shift. You know, it's the overnight shift. There's, he's going to get shot. And so I thought, why don't we start? fixing houses and building houses and that's what we got into so then it started you know the the remodeling windows roofing siding i started another one in that winter which uh which was building custom homes and that was because the crews couldn't work in the chicago suburbs during the winter when it was nasty out so if i dug the hole put a foundation and put the shell up uh all winter long i can have them finish the inside of the house and then the third one that I started uh, right around 90, uh, that was actually 2000 was the third one was a basement waterproofing company. And, uh, and, and so from there, sold them, closed two of them, uh, sold one of them. And then I just became a mercenary for about 10 years because companies would come in and be like, dude, you could sell ice to an Eskimo, teach our people how to do this. And I was like, okay. And I'd do two-year stints and I'd take an equity piece out as part of my consulting fee. And it was two years because I didn't want to get tied down. I was like, yeah. two, two years in and out, turn it around, flip it, do it again, turn it around, flip it. And and then finally, my best friend, uh, one of my best friends on the planet, who we've been friends with since we were 16 years old, he's like, you know, the Sandler thing, uh, I'm a, I've am been a client for five years, Tim. I'm like, what in God's name is Sandler? And he starts telling me this. And of course, my eyes roll in the back of my head. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> it's just terrible. Like, I can't do this. And uh and he shared it with me and and then yeah, that's ultimately how I got hooked on it because I looked at it and I'm like, I could do that. Yeah. I could do that. That's way yeah. more systematic than what I yeah. was doing. Yeah. And here I am. So seven years later. And loving it. Uh, love it. Yeah. Well, love. it's so interesting because I mean the journey is so much, and you know, you mentioned the personal side of that earlier too. This journey was so much about what you could accomplish and like your individual impact and in, you know you like your pathway and now like your journey is so much about other people's 
pathway, you know, in like their potential. And even, you know, like you taking like the challenge of like who you are, you know, and IR and, you know, just really treat like, you know, talk, coming to people as whole people, not a role, a job, an outcome, a goal, like so interesting. Like, wow. Uh, it's fun. The, 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 the fact remains this is that, uh, when you look at in corporate America, you either drive culture or culture organically happens and it's yes. done to you. Yes. And so for me, I'm like, look, let's sit down with leadership and the ownership and figure out what kind of culture do you want to have here? And then we start to build teams through that and we build processes through that. Um, you can hire to that type of thing too, if you're sophisticated enough with it, yeah. um, which is why I use behavioral assessments because I want to see how people are hardwired. Yeah. You know, when you're in an interview with someone, uh, that's the best version of themselves. You know, Kyle, if you're interviewing for a job with me, mm. you're never going to go, hey, Tim, I'm going to suck at this. I'm going to disappoint you there. I'm never going to follow through. Uh, I might show up three days a week, you know, and, and uh. two of those, I'll probably be hung over because I drank too much bourbon. And, and whatever, you're never going to say that. You're going to present like it's first date. It's the best yeah. version of yourself. And people are like that in real life. So, you know, if I interview someone and they can survive my first interview, then I will do an, a behavioral assessment because then I can see how they're hardwired. And, and the tool itself doesn't, I would never disqualify someone just based on the tool itself. Right. What you want to do is you want to take the human experience, you know, and then you want to, you want to look at the data and the science, and then you ask better questions in the second interview. Uh, and if, okay. if, you know, even if there's a contradiction, you say, say somebody's uh, score is really low on ambition and drive. And that's for a salesperson. That's the number one thing you have to have ambition and drive because that's your motor. Yeah. Like what's going to make you pick that phone up 500 times this week is your ambition and drive. You wake out of, get out of bed and you're like, you know, you open up your Superman, like, and you just fly off. I need that to be super high. Well, you can say it, uh, but I can look at it and scientifically measure it. And so if it doesn't match up in that interview, if I still like you anyway, I'll go, well, what about this? And if you can actually, I'll give you a behavioral question where you have to work your way out of it. And if I'm convinced by it, then the process works, even though the data is different from what I'm experiencing. I love to hear that. Yeah. You, you hear so many people uh, not even get into an interview because of how much um, AI has almost filtered out the yeah. resume process and so forth. Horrible. Or you do take an assessment and be like, never got a call back. Like, should I yeah. fudge? You know what they're looking for in a way in some of these assessments. Yeah. You know, and they say, well, I can call BS on that too. Yeah, you know, you bet. But, um, you know, I'm like, what about the personal side of things? You know, yeah. if you're, especially in sales, uh, if you're talking to humans all the time, that has to be a metric of itself yeah. outside of the data. And to combine those two are very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually what my clients love the most about they love the sales training and I do leadership yeah. training as well. Uh, they love that piece of it because uh, most HR organizations don't have something that quite that sophisticated. Like I've got behavioral and organizational psychologists on my team. And so when I'm looking at, uh, you know, I'll, I'll create my, you know, the, the, the stock interview questions in the beginning and I'm watching, I'm watching body language. I'm yeah. paying attention to tonality. I, I'm looking at all of the, the variables. I'm listening to the words. I'm letting them sink in. And I want them to provide me with an experience to, to show me and demonstrate that they can execute for results. Uh, the, the science helps me do that. But once I get to that second interview, then I'm bringing, I'm going nuclear. Then I'm bringing in, you know, people that are 10 X smarter than me. And, and yeah. if they can survive that thing, uh, then I can go to the, you know, my client and go, you should hire that one. And they do. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, his first job, you basically just told me a while ago, you're like, Oh my gosh, this is like HR. This is horrible. And now he's a professional <laughs> on top of HR as it ever gets. <laughs> Think about that, that connection. Yes. He was, you, in a way, I, you, I know you're in sales in this, but For as sure. far as HR, the psychology, hiring, you find the right fit, the right people, how things are orchestrated. That, yeah. That's uh, outside of operations. That's the key right there. Yeah. Well, and I also stack the deck in my favor too, because 
those are the same clients that I do sales training for. Nice. So I know that they're trainable. I know how how trainable. I can yeah. measure how trainable. Yeah. And, uh, and and then, of course, I set what we call an upfront contract with everybody. So anytime there's an offer extended by the client, uh, the, the upfront contract is, here's what excellence looks like. Here's what expectations are in terms of execution of behaviors. Mm-hmm. Here are the top 10 behaviors you are expected to, to execute. Uh, and if you fail at them, that's okay. We want you to fail fast, but we want the ramp. We want the first two wheels, the front wheels of that 747 off the okay. runway inside of 90 days. And then we want flight at 91 and go. And, 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 and if they can't, and there's different roles. So sales is obviously different than if you're hiring a, you know, a director of HR or, or any other role. Sales is somewhat unique. But uh, regardless of the, the, the role, you have to have a top 10 list of behaviors for that role. I don't care if it's an executive administrator or, or a CFO. you got to know what that is, and you have to be able to hold them accountable. So you set the goals with them. Uh, you're super specific in what expectations are for execution of for for excellence, and if they don't hit the required mark, then you you know you have to look at okay which part of that equalizer do I have to turn up? Is it a training thing? Is it a will thing? Or is yeah. it a skill thing? If it's skill, I can train it. If it's a will thing, I can't teach will. Nope. And for me, that's I, I'm uh, super slow to hire, super fast to 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 get rid of. And I don't want you know when you look at most companies have the 20-60-20 ratio. It's 20% of their employees are top performers, 60% are wow. in the middle and variable, and then 20% are the low. Yep. I don't want low, I don't want 20, the low 20%. C's yeah. are out, and that's how I run my business, and that's how I help my clients run theirs too. Is that the true ratio on that? Yep. 20. I always used to tell her, I was like, in, in when I was in sales, I was like, you always see the top 25% performing. It, well, maybe it was just what I was in. And um, I'm like, they carry the business. They are the innovators. They're the ones outperforming everybody, always. Yep. And I'm like, there's 50% just drifting, and the bottom 25, like you said, will never get wait. better. It was almost on it. it. You could watch it and go up. They could try anything they want, and they're just not going to be any better than that. Yeah. At, at say, they're in the wrong profession. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds. Um, it, it might sound a little terrible, Kyle, but yeah. th- you have to remember, like the top, the bottom twenty percent of of any any organization, performance wise, they're miserable too. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, they don't yeah. just suck at what they do. Yeah. I, I, they're yeah. miserable too, and so it's my job to make them allow them to go be happy somewhere else. That's yeah. literally how I look at it. It's not like, oh, you're yeah. messing with people's livelihoods. You know, you're, I'm helping them be happy somewhere else because clearly they're not happy here. Now, yeah. there's times and there's, ex- there's circumstances. There's never any absolutes in anything right. in the business world. So somebody may be going through this like horrific deal where they have a, a, a parent or a family member who's going through cancer or whatever, and you're just, you're, they're crushed. Yeah. And so there's, there needs to be some grace involved, of course. And, and some, some humility and judgment. You have to get the facts and the data. But what I will also submit is that most of your bottom 20% performers uh, are just bottom 20% performers. The exception would be the, oh, you know, my wife and I are, you know, struggling with a kid that has cancer. That's the exception, not the norm. Yeah, totally. Right. So that's totally. that's how I look at it. And then it's, it's, it's still humane and there's still uh, empathy involved. Because, again, I... I you know, they say, oh, you can't make judgments. And I always call bullshit. I'm like, we make thousands of judgments. We judge each other every day in 10,000 different ways. All the time. Ways. We have to. Yeah. It's it, how it, you organize the world. It's not a big for sure. deal. Yeah. For sure. I mean, that's yeah. how we that's how we gauge ourselves. Yes. 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 You and know. we have to. And yeah. we live in this society where you can't judge me. Actually, I can. <laughs> yeah. And I should. <laughs> You know, I, I really should. And if I don't, it's at my own peril and the peril of my, my, my team and my family if I don't make judgments. Now, there are bad judgments, of course, if you do stuff like, oh, you know, blanket on skin color or religion or what, whatever it is. Those are not judgments you want. You should anybody should be making because people are people. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I read a book uh, by Thomas Sowell um, and it's called Discrimination and divisions, or 
oh, goodness. Uh, but he, he said there's two types of discrimination. There's discrimination one, and it's uh, discriminating based on the conversation you're having with the person in front of you. It's, it's, it's not based on discrimination two, which is gender, yeah. uh, you know, sexual oppressions, skin yeah. color, none of that stuff. Prejudices. And I, thought, yeah. I was like, ah. Oh. That's really true because, again, we've been programmed that we live in this world where, you know, live and live, live, everything is permissible, uh, even stupid stuff. And what he said, and I thought oh, I, that resonated with me, is that we make discriminating judgments constantly. Yeah. And it's part of the, like, we have fight or flight instincts that's woven into yes. our DNA. Yeah. And, and you know, I would be an idiot if I had a bunch of, you know, uh, Irish dudes. I'm Irish. If I had a bunch of Irish guys coming in with baseball bats and, you know, Lucille from, uh, you know, from The Walking Dead, you know, with the barbed wire on it and it's bleeding and this, that, and when I'm walking down the street and I don't cross the street, well, you can't be stunned that I got my brains beat in by the dude because I was an idiot. I should have been more discriminating. And, and so, again, it's very nuanced and it's very complex, but that's the type of stuff that I wrestle with in like the real world. It's why I incessantly read about um, race relations. I read incessantly about different religions and, and, and world history is so amazing because all of those things kind of come to play and you see yeah. how it, it creates these biases and even belief systems that can be so completely wrong and in the business world, uh, I need to see through all of that stuff. Yeah. I need to look at the person for the person. And so, well, that's also why I like the behavioral assessments because I'm like, I'm going to do an x-ray on you before I hire you yeah. to figure out if you, if you, I should be asking different questions. That's awesome. So anyway, that's, I know I'm on a rant, but that's how I roll. I love it. I I love it. Love it. So if you could give people one specific encouragement or piece of advice, you know, what would it be? Uh, I think that I heard something in an interview with, there's a pop singer, her name is Halsey. Mm -hmm. And she said something that I thought was one of the most profound things. I, I was like, wow, especially, especially she's, young and she's this pop singer that lives in this bubble of like fame and wealth and this, that, and whatever. But what she said was amazing. And her story is fantastic because she struggled with, you know, uh, depression and and stuff like this. But what she said is, uh, you got to realize that you're not the center of the universe. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, not everything is about you. Some things just are. And I was like, Oh, it was amazing. And I love her voice on top of it. Yeah. So I'm like, please sing whatever it is. Just that was cool. Now go sing without you. <laughs> <Terrible>. <laughs> so I, I think that's another one. And I think, uh, I, I another, my final piece of advice would, uh, you know, pick a lane, be passionate about it. Um, but passion isn't going to get you there. It takes tons of hard work and I don't care if it's, you know, hard work to build a business or to build a successful marriage. Uh, you know, nothing ever stays the same. If you take the snapshot yeah. of, you know, uh, you and Kyle on your wedding day, uh, you're different. Now you had a choice. You can either sit there and wax ecstatic about, Oh my God, I wish it was like that. Cause that day was so great. Or you can realize that you guys are literally like these molecular beings that are, and if you, you can grow together and it could be way more fun or you, if you don't pay attention to it, you can fall apart. The That's same right. thing happens with your business. Like you go, oh, I'm so excited. I'm all jazzed up about, you know, selling sales and leadership training and business consulting and executive coaching. It's so exciting. But if you don't do the hard work behind it, uh, it, it, it's, it's like a house of cards. It just, it shatters at the first breath of wind. Yeah. And so I guess that would be my, that's my philosophical. That's great. That was my son. Yeah, I love I'm it. Go in the lotus position. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, well, since we got married, I've gotten better with age. So absolutely, I'm good. To go. <laughs> Same. But he loves just, to he yeah. loves to embarrass me by saying oh. she's my second wife, and I'm like, well, and then he'll just, go, "Well, yeah. I mean, I technically she's my first wife too." But like, I'm like, well, I get bored, babe. Like, hold on, let me defend myself that. right here. Like. Everyone goes through changes in life. I mean, that's hundred percent. You know, no matter what, right? And um, and you grow, and you get married for a reason. Especially when we're you're young. We yes. were we were only twenty five. Some that might not seem young, but it is young. It's young. And um, you just experience things, and you, you don't really figure yourself out until later. 
and you can be on board with that person still or not. Yep. And it's just like, oh, wow, we figured out a way to just come back. And it's a different experience now. Yeah. It's um, like getting a divorce and getting remarried to somebody you were supposed to be with. Yeah. Um, who you're connected in a way you realize um, uh, who they really are. And um, it's okay to be different. Yeah. Thank um, God I like this version of you. No, it, it's okay to be different. <laughs> well, and so it, it's like having a second wife because we have under, we understand where we're at now yeah. and, are, and are fine with that. Yep. Um, I don't know. We had this huge conversation not long ago. Ah, this is a rabbit hole about the past, present, future, and um, and and I'm like, do you understand? We only live in the present. Like that's present. You know, it just yeah. ended. It just ended. It just ended. I go. So many people focus on the past. Why? The only thing we have to look forward to is the future. That's it. Yeah. I go. You can only learn from that. Just take a snapshot and learn from it and move on. Uh, it, when you get caught up in that. It never, we were sitting there and I go, think about people who talk about the past a lot, live in the past. And I'm not talking historically. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. go nine times out of 10. Well, I, actually, I couldn't even prove it was more than nine times out of 10 that they don't have drive to succeed further in careers or anything. It's, it's weird. And I just started bringing up random people. Um, who are one way or the other. And I'm like, you never hear this person harp about the past or how hard it was. They only talk about right now or the future. And I went, there's got to be something to that. It, I know it sounds sim- simplistic. No, no, no. I, but I, I think you're it's, onto it. It's really deep when we were talking about it the other day. No, of going, I completely agree. Oh, my gosh. The reason they haven't gotten any further. Now, and I, I wasn't judging them as far as thinking that person should accomplish more than what they have, but they're just stuck in that. You could just um, see they, alignment there yeah. with focusing on what was behind them. Yeah, versus in their lack of progress in certain places. And it's just interesting. It's yeah. it's interesting when you think of the analogy of, of when you get in your car on your way home. I want you to think about this because this is literally how I look at life. <clears throat> when you're in the car. Uh, you're staring forward, you've got 32 square feet of glass in front of you. And so you can see all the world in front of you and you're moving through it, you know, at whatever miles an hour. Me, I prefer 110. (laughs) So I'm going 110. So I'm looking at the world in front of me. Now, there's also 32 square inches of mirror for me to see what's behind me and and to reflect. And that's how I live my life too. Uh, I, I, it's okay to get some historical reference for what I've yeah. done. Like what lessons have I learned and the failures and the, the massive, you know, different, the massive train wrecks in my life that, that I don't want to replicate. And so I can go, Doot. and when you're in driver's ed, they tell you, at least this is what they told me when you're driving every 15 seconds, just take a glance in the mirror to see what's going on behind you. And that's true. And it's a glance. Yeah. Most people, like sit and they look at the freaking mirror yes. and that's all they look at. And the problem is, is that you've got a, uh, an eight foot wide uh, circumference Oak in front of you and you're missing it because they're too busy looking in the past. Yeah. And so Dr. Tasha Yurek wrote a book called insight. I think it's one of the coolest books I've read because it's talking about how, uh, how self-awareness is a skill that you can learn. It's a, it's a discipline. And, and what she said was we tend to, ruminate and wallow in, in, in that past. And so yeah. for me, I yes. just won't look at the rear view mirror. Like I've learned some amazing lessons. Well, you said you reflect. Yes. That's a perfect word for what yes. you actually do. You don't look and stare. Those are the ones that are yeah. sitting at the red light who you have to honk their horn at because they won't move. Right. Yeah. It's the same concept. Yeah. I love that. Yep. Totally. Totally. All right. Any final questions before we let him oh. tell everybody where they can find him? You, uh, no, no, it's been great. I know yeah, this has been, been really so good. fun. How long have we been doing this? Um, a minute, hour and a half. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, wow. I love it. I know. No, it's, it's good. Yeah. I know, and it flies. It's fine. By. Like we don't know what will ever happen with this. You know, we're just getting going and figuring it out. But we it's we're having fun Rogan. doing it, it and is. meeting great people that I normally, you know, I don't know when I'd ever. I've heard about you for years now. Yeah. yeah. And we got to sit for an hour and a half. 
talk, not eat anything. Deep in, we baby. Drinking beer somewhere at this moment, maybe yeah. later. Well, we'll see what <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, it's different conversations. You know, I was talking to four, of my, three of my best friends, or four of us that kind of hang out, and I'm like, we need to like meet outside of barbecuing or outside of a pool party or whatever, and have a conversation. And they're like, yeah, we do. Yes. Like once a week, just yeah. something. Throw uh, thoughts off each other. It's got to be intentional, though. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It has to be intentional. It's like for the German and I, uh, we plan date night. We yeah. plan it. And, and we make it happen because life is busy. Like, she's working like crazy. Uh, I'm only working 35 hours a week. <laughs> so Kyle, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give this to you j- just so you can use this because you're a handsome dude. So uh, I am the trophy husband. So, you know, so that's why I only work. I, I only want to work three. Because I'm the trophy husband. The trophy husband doesn't work. No, uh, no, but he is trying you're, to be. He, no, first you're discrediting yourself a ton because of uh, how much you're reading that you apply to your work. You're not counting those hours. No, yeah, good point. You know, no. uh, there's more work. It's just you enjoy doing. It. That's part of it's your awesome. life. It yeah. fills you up. Yeah, yeah. Yep. that's amazing. Yeah, that's uh, the other the other pieces. Keep up the good work. You know, keep doing this stuff um you, you never know where this is going to go uh just based on what i know about dacia she's a world beater and this is going <laughs> to yeah. this is going to work so continue to do that if you ever need you know help or want me on this again maybe people are going to be like that guy I, you never put him on there again he made fun of <laughs> hr department <laughs> yeah. didn't don't worry yeah. we have stuff more, stuff coming <laughs> that we will share with you yeah okay yeah. so where can people find you though um, I'm not really on social media on LinkedIn. I could be, you can look under Timothy J. Barry. Uh, I think I'm the real Tim Barry. B-A-R-R-Y. B-A-R-R-Y. The real mm-hmm. Tim Barry. B-A-R-R-Y. Or maybe it's Tim Barry executive coach. Uh, my website is, uh, is TJ Barry and associates.com. TJ Barry and associates, plural.com. Uh, and it's also TJ Barry dot Sandler.com. And so those are my, that's, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. So perfect. And we'll put all of those in the show notes and such like that. So thank you again. This was so fun. This was ridiculous. This is the first time I've ever done this. Uh, I I love you guys. I I will do this anytime you want. This is ridiculous. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Onward and upward. Amen. Adios. If you enjoyed this episode of the Corporate Caffeine Podcast, please help us help you by subscribing. I also hope you'll find us on social media. You can follow me, Dacia Coffee, and my company, The Marketing Blender, by searching us on your favorite platform or checking out the show notes for the links. We bring this to you because we envision a business world full of meaning, connection, and prosperity for us all. Until next time, onward and upward.